Okay. And, and then as we talk, nice. <laughs> So Matthew, uh, I understand you're a little bit insecure. I am a little insecure, you know, <laughs> <laughs> a low self-esteem. It is what it is. <laughs> so hopefully today we can uh, we can introduce some security into that insecurity and uh, and understand what customers can do to, uh, you know, drive or use some of the capabilities in Azure rather to drive some improvements or monitoring capabilities to properties or workloads they might have running in Azure. Yeah, looking forward to it. Who we got today? Yeah, so uh, Adam, you know, thanks for joining us today. Hello. <laughs> so he's excited. Uh, I could tell we got a live fish today. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, I, I understand that um, you know you've been doing a lot of work in this space, um, yep. helping our customers in you know introducing you know appliances and and capabilities in front of either public facing or even internally facing workloads uh, to to protect them to you know to um, you know, detect and, re and remediate, automatically remediate, uh, um, you know, risks such as, um, you know, things like cross-site scripting attacks and, um, and that sort of thing. So, um, Correct. Yeah, and, and then within Azure, we have, you know, some capabilities called the, the Web Application Firewall that uh, I know you're going to dive into a little bit and hopefully tell yep. us a little bit more about and how it works. Yeah, okay. so Adam, uh, t tell us how we can protect ourselves from these bad guys. <laughs> yeah, so when, when I think about the Internet, there's some good guys, you know, your users and the people that are supposed to be accessing your, your web workloads, but probably you really want to be defending against mostly bad guys that are going to be out there. Um, there's oh. a lot of bad guys out there, unfortunately. Or and, Al Gore, he built the Internet for nothing, just for the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, <legacy>. just <laughs> tubes of bad guys everywhere, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> So what, you probably have a, a workload of some type that accepts HTTP, HTTPS, or HTTP2 traffic. Um, maybe it's in a virtual network. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a straight-up Azure web app. Um, I, a, any of these are something that can be protected by the Azure Application Gateway WAF. Um, in, in a normally segmented, um, secured network, like this is a PaaS service that can be baked right into your edge subnet act as an edge device, and that's something you typically look to the partner channel for, right? So you, whether you're looking at a Barracuda next-gen firewall or a Checkpoint firewall or, you know, Palo Alto, you know, any of those premier products, um, you can get some of that same functionality with this native service, this native PaaS service at Azure Application Gateway. And it's capable of protecting, you know, whether it's your IaaS VM-based web workloads, like your hosting stuff in IaaS. Um, you have an app service environment that's baked into your vNet, you can protect that. Um, Azure Web Apps, um, API Management, Service Fabric, AKS, like any of these things, right? As long as you're doing AD, 443, HTTP2 traffic, like all that works. No okay. problem. So, so you did contrast that with a customer running on-premises or used to, you know, racking and stacking, you know, some, some you know, pretty expensive physical devices that do this sort of right. thing. Um, you know, so this is just a carryover of that concept in, into the cloud. That's right. Okay. So how about a compare contrast between those partners that you just talked about and the first party in, in a very simple way, right? What would be my probably one question to answer to decide between the two partner or, you know, first party versus third party? Uh, well, I, I know that there's a lot of improvements coming on the application gateway. Um, so I didn't say it was bad. I just said, what was the <laughs> well, I'm just, I, it, my, 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 uh, it depends on the capabilities that you're looking for and how much customization you want to do within um, within the product, right? Um, okay. So it, both both of those factors are go are going to play into it. Um, Application Gateway uses some very basic standards um, out of the box. There's sort of limited capability to configure and customize those, um, whereas you're going to be able to do a lot more with some of those external third-party devices. Okay, so it's very specialized consistent. rules and filters and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's pretty consistent with our general uh, marketing strategy and our product strategy, which is entry point to our cloud if you need these basic services. But if you need expanded services, go third party. That's why we have a partner ecosystem mar marketplace, right? That's right. Absolutely. All right. Good deal. Yep. And, okay, I'll dive, it, dive back in here. Um, so when I think about Application Gateway, this is, part of a effective defense in depth strategy, right? This is something that we should all um, be uh, working towards and make sure that we're, uh, we're enforcing. Um, just one, one level of defense is not, 
not appropriate or sufficient for, for many workloads. And when I think about uh, defense in depth, I immediately think of Sauron from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think this is the first Lord of the Rings reference. Yeah, <laughs> so, sorry, I'm going to nerd out and talk oh, about Lord of the Rings perfect. for a few minutes here. Perfect. But um, when I think about Burning Eye of Sauron, I kind of think about how Microsoft manages security for all of Azure, right? Mm -hmm. So we have these super advanced uh, machine learning algorithms constantly scanning against ingress traffic and, you know, trying to detect threat patterns, attackers, botnets, and we're able to effectively shut those down, you know, gather all of our resources, unleash uh, a counterattack against those, and lock it all down, right? And that that's great, but the burning eye of Sauron can't look everywhere in Mordor at once, right? True, true. Frodo figured that out, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's where it's good to have things like network DDoS. So the, the ring race, they can run around and provide some, uh, some smaller scale capabilities, right? So yep. Some, yep. some of the same capabilities that the Burning Eyes Storm provides, but, you know, in a, in a smaller scale and a more targeted manner. So network DDoS is something you can turn on inside of your virtual network. Every virtual network has basic enabled on it by default. But there's a standard SKU that provides um, further um, DDoS capabilities um, that takes advantage of some of the same machine learning algorithms and capabilities that are provided by the general Azure Fabric security. All right, on. <clears throat> right. So, so we so, so just to kind of um, you know pivot on that a little bit. We you, when you deploy something um, you know simplified or to, to simplify it rather um, you know like a, a virtual machine, we actually deploy that with a private IP address. Um, and if you want to do it publicly, expose it. And we have a public IP address that we actually NAT traffic. Uh, back and forth. So that, that layer actually protects or insulates customers from things like distributed denial service attacks. Um, and this kind of goes a step farther where you can actually introduce some additional uh, protections and, and countermeasures or, or, or uh, you know, alerting to be able to notify customers when, you know, should something like that happen. Yep, that's right. So, and then, so and, and one, one thing just to, to highlight on that too, that, that we always think about external denial service attacks, but um, just a, a quick tangential side note. I'm, I do a lot of stuff with a, a, some robotics teams, and um, about uh, um, I guess it was five, you know, seven years ago, uh, there there was a, a, a Wi-Fi based control system that was used to be able to, uh, you know, allow the the drivers to be able to remotely operate robots in, in these uh, robotics competitions. And there were some some teams from you know some other countries that had discovered in, uh, you know, some flaws and kind of how that communication worked and actually deployed some denial of service attacks during the event. <laughs> so these are nice. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so it's not always just thinking external, you know, you have to think about that. You know, there, there's, there's potential threats and, and issues that could happen internally. So too. nerds play dirty too. I love yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Great, yeah. It's moral to that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then uh, the the thing that's funny about this is I think this is where uh, this is where Soren kind of kind of screwed up, right? He didn't employ a, an effective defense and depth strategy because he never thought that two little hobbits <laughs> could sneak all the way through Mordor, climb all the way up Mount Doom, and be able to get in at his delicious infrastructure, right? My precious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if if Soren was was smart, right, he would have employed an effective defense and depth strategy. He would have put a big door on the middle of uh, that big cavern in Mount Doom, and this is where something like Application Gateway kind of comes into play, right? So when you employ effective defense and depth strategy, you get sad bad guys and or <laughs> crying hobbits, depending on your perspective. So. Nice. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Uh, so, how does this thing work? So basically how, how the application gateway works is there's a public IP or not, it's optional, right? Because we were talking about the internal scenario as well. Um, you want to pretend, you want to protect against both public and internal um, traffic patterns. That's bound to a front end port. And those are listening on, those, those have listeners attached to them. Each of the listeners can be bound to a specific host port uh, certificate, right? So let's say you have a bunch of different SSL sites all routed on, uh, all, all sitting on one application gateway, those can all coexist, right? In order to route traffic to some sort of secured backend pool, it's looking at a rule, right? Where do I go? Where is this traffic supposed to go? Um, it's going to get routed to that backend pool. 
And to get to that backend pool, it's going to use certain HTTP settings, right? So this is a scenario where you know you can you can either choose to do end-to-end -end SSL or maybe maybe drop SSL altogether and do um, SSL offloading, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to determine whether or not a backend pool should be accessed by that rule, um, the settings have a probe assigned to them, and the probe detects you know if if all the backend pool members are healthy. So let's say you have two ISVMs in an availability set, right? Um, the probe will be probing both of those, and if one of those is failing, it'll get taken out of that um, load balance rotation, and no traffic will get directed to that until the probe can start responding um, with a positive positive response again. Now that probe, I think this is one one of my stumbling blocks with customers is that probe is customizable, right, for the port that it wants to go ping against or do the yep. help check against. Yeah, yep. and that's actually defined through the which. Because I think that's where we get lost sometimes. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about. I, I spend a lot of time teaching people how probes work and when right. uh, when you need to use host names, no host names, uh, what settings you need for them. I'll actually go into that a little bit later. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so here, let's do, uh, let's do a quick demo here. Okay, so I have, the, I have basically the same web app deployed out a couple different ways. So I'm going to show um, how to secure this um, for an IaaS workload. So, you know, just a website running on an IaaS site. I'm going to show how to do it on a, on a PaaS service that has internal VNet connectivity, so app service environment in this scenario. And finally, I'm going to show um, how to do this with an Azure website through a technique called IP filtering. That's Provided, but not many people have used to protect just a native yeah. Azure web app, right? Yeah. So let's uh, let's dive into the Azure portal. This is a good time, and I will uh, I'll drive through some quick configuration stuff. Let me get <clears throat> get those public IP addresses. I'm gonna do some port scanning. <laughs> 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 well, you start crying, Ryan, once the you know you find out you can't get in. I want <laughs> yeah. a picture of that. <laughs> so, real quick, I have I have one application gateway, right? I have all my sites hosted on the same application gateway. I have WAP tier enabled. Um, when you right now, this, I, there are two modes. That right, it's important to note that you have to enable the uh, the WAP capability. Yeah, you have to ensure you you're using the WAP SKU, not the uh, not the standard. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, right now, I have this in detection. Be real easy to flip it to prevention mode. Um, you have a couple different rule sets you can choose between. Um, it's just these two. Unfortunately, you can't add your own rule set or roll your own rule set if you decide to do that. That's where um, that partner ecosystem really comes into play if you want to right. do some deep customization. Okay. Um, the, the one nice thing about this is you can go into advanced rule configuration and um, turn some of these on or off. So you do have that option. But, this is our... Uh, this is the OWASP base that is, frankly, I find a lot of people that just, once you get to this point, they're like, yeah, that's good, I'm out, you know. Yeah. It, it's funny, like, what I'll see a lot of customers do, too, is they'll turn on detection mode for a while and mm -hmm. let it run and see what comes back out of it and see what's yeah. being hit and figure out, hey, maybe I should go in and make sure that we're, we're turning off a couple rules that we don't think are, we think these are false positives. Like, right. I have people yeah. do that as well. Yeah, and we also allow customers to do their own penetration testing using those those rule sets specifically. You know, that's something we allow customers right. to do against po properties they have in Azure. So, so right. we still itself. require that form though as part of that. Process. No, we don't. No, they, they don't. Oh, have to there we go. Nice. <laughs> yep, that's good. So here, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the uh, with the IaaS workload. So this is just my www site, and I'm going to pop in here and kind of trace down here. So I'm gonna start with the listener, right? So mm -hmm. On 443, I have a custom host name because it's not on the default website on IIS, and I have a PFX loaded up here. I made a wildcard. It's uh, not a real wildcard, but it's one that I generated. <laughs> um, and then it's going to use this rule, right, my www rule, to route to a backend pool. In this scenario, it's just that ISVM, so I have a Bastion host sitting in a, in a backend subnet, um, you know, pointing at the NIC. Just that easy. And then the thing that's interesting about this is if I go to the HTTP settings, I'm offloading SSL. So this provides a light performance improvement. Um, depending, depending on what you're doing, it can be a heavy performance improvement if you're hitting this at scale. But I'm basically saying, hey, there's no SSL on my back end. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and just route everything over port 80. Mm -hmm. This is something <clears throat> customers have to make a conscious decision about because now the traffic between a load balancer and their website is not not encrypted. Right. So yep. if you had that's right. So for a number of different compliant like compliance offerings, they're going to have to do end to end SSL, and I've yeah. I've seen a lot of that. And there's and we'll dive into that on the uh, on the ASC. So ASC is a little bit different. Um, the back end pool in this scenario. Here I'm going to pop up pop up in my ASC real quick. And this is my app service environment. I have one app and sitting inside of it. We should probably clarify that just to make sure people are uh, hosting environment for web applications. So, yeah, that's uh, right. Different than, than VMs where we actually manage infrastructure for the customer. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, the thing to note here is my backend pool is going to be the internal IP address for, mm -hmm. for this app service environment. Um, and all the traffic will route, route the same way. Um, I have a custom host inside of here. Um, it's called ASD Internal. Uh, let's go back here. So that's that same backend, backend setting. And then on my HTTP, HTTP setting in this scenario, um, I'm using an authentic, authentication certificate on the backend, right? So mm -hmm. this is that end-to-end -end SSL scenario where I'm running everything over HTTPS the entire time. Basically, the request comes into the application gateway, gets checked out, and then gets re-encrypted and forwarded onto the appropriate backend server using that white list. a different certificate. Yeah. That's okay. right. <clears throat> That's right. Um, and then there's, uh, obviously, everything is using custom probes because I have host names. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> and then finally, um, this is the Azure app service, right? So a lot of people will typically say, hey, if, if I'm just running an Azure web app, I have no security. I have to count on Microsoft to provide all of that protection for the for um, the Azure Fabric or through the Azure Fabric. And, you know, any attack is basically going to be through there. I have no control. I can't, you know, put any sort of security device uh, in front of this thing. Not true. You can do it. Um, so I'm going to show, I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. Um, basically the same setup. Um, in this scenario, my backend pool for the Azure web website is going to be pointing at the FTDN of the site mm -hmm. itself, right? Um, this is the, the pure platform as a service play. You know, the yeah. other one was more controlled app service environment because it's deployed no private network. This is actually using a full public service. There's less yep. control over the infrastructure is running on, and you're just introducing layers in front of that. That's mm -hmm. right. Yep. Okay. That's right. So, um, you know, that's, that, that's my backend pool. I'm saying, hey, go right out to Azure Pass. Mm -hmm. And then same deal as the app service environment, right? I'm going to connect over 443. Um, I'm going to use that whitelist CER to connect. Um, I have the same deal, custom probe. Um, but let's go look at that. So, so I have a question about that. So. In that scenario, sure. you've got now you have this this virtual device sitting in front of your web application that is, you know, the traffic can flow through. However, if I knew that that fully qualified domain name of the of the hosted site, you could still hit that and circumvent your your load balancer. Correct. Oh, here's Good. where the next magic's coming. Yeah, oh, this is where the next magic happens, <laughs> which is why we're going to enforce IP filtering. Yep. Ah, okay. Okay. So. Um, we'll go in, we'll go into that real quick. So if I go down to, this is, this is my app, right? Cause you're absolutely right. If I wasn't doing this, you can completely route again, route around the web. If I knew that and, name, that's the public name. Every yep. website in Azure, we give, give a, a name with that, that particular yep. domain. App. And this is where things get fun is mm -hmm. inside of networking and IP, IP restrictions. So what I've done here, as I said, I'm only going to allow traffic to this Azure, Azure website from this IP address. This is the IP address that's the public IP of the Azure application gateway. Yep, My subnet way. math yeah. is, yep, just this, just this one. 255 is all the way around. Yep. Nice. And then just to, uh, we'll, we'll go back here real quick. Obviously, this is, this is still working, working. This is my external app. Uh, and just to prove the point, I have a different VM running here. And I have a host entry on this machine that's routing directly to appexternal.abtcustom.com, basically the A record for that Azure mm -hmm. app service. And every time I try to hit it from this VM, that's all I get. 403 Denied. forbidden. Yep. 
Cool. No access. So it's pretty neat. Yep, that is very nice. So do you, uh, let me ask you this. So when dealing with customers um, who specifically have I've come across this a couple times where they, they see this and they go, yeah, but is that secure? And I oftentimes I have to tell them, so where, where do you, where are we getting lost, right? You know, how much trust mm -hmm. are you giving to us? Or do you have to see the magic sauce that's going on behind, you know, and so forth? So one of the things that comes out of this is specific NetFlow tracking in through the app gateway um, and statistics and stuff like that. Um, we've hooked up some of the log analytics stuff now to be able to start looking more of that flow data. Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh, I saw an eyebrow. I must be hitting something. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're absolutely going to get to that. Good. So, so there, th there's a couple scenarios where this doesn't work, um, and I just want to want to be real transparent. This is only level seven traffic. So, yeah. if you're talking about doing level level four um, sort of network routing stuff like that, um, this this isn't going to help you. Right. Yeah. This is just HTTP, HTTPS. Like, if you want to do true network load balancing, or you know, put a firewall in front of like FTP traffic, or let's say you need to deploy stuff to Service Fabric from some external IP address, you're not going to be able to route um, route through an application gateway to do that. You have to find another way around it, and that's where that. that so yep. more so this is the distinguishing between first party entry getting you to the basics and the core of using our cloud to now have a really complex application area or a really complex business case scenario where I've got to do a lot of extra stuff. Yeah, and, that's right. areas. And, and you showed how, how easy it was on the configuration yeah. side, side in our yeah. application gateway, just a bunch of check boxes. And, you know, obviously with more capability comes more sophistication and complexity from configuration. So we make it very easy. That's right. Yep, yeah. Yep, okay. I didn't look like this for no reason. All right. I've done a lot with <laughs> wax. And just to, to, to highlight, you know, I know we, we said it a couple of times in OWASP, but it's an open web application uh, security project. So kind of a consortium of, of standards uh, based tests that, that can be, um, you know, that, that can be upheld against a, you know, web application or, you know, some of these different protocols you highlight here, HTTP, HTTPS and, and so forth. Um, you know, and things like like cross-site scripting and SQL injection and that sort of thing, right? That's right. Should, okay. Yeah, we should put a we'll put a link in the show notes about that. But I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, that'd be great. So, mo most of my time, unfortunately, is spent spent on common points of confusion with App Gateway when I'm when I'm working with my customers, and a lot of they have a hard time understanding some of the documentation we provide around. Um, SKUs and sizing, um, like how, how big does their gateway need to be? Like w how should they actual, actually determine throughput and, um, you know, size this thing appropriately and choose the right instances? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we absolutely struggle with, we talked about it a little bit ago, is probe configuration and customization. And uh, finally, like trying to figure out if things are healthy. Like m I run into unknown backend health status almost every day, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about each of those just because they're 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 common. If I can help five people with this, I, I would say my job is done. <laughs> well, here's one. So that's four to go. <laughs> you got two. So, <laughs> oh, don't count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a chart that we provide on our uh, on our doc site, and basically what this is saying, and I, a lot of people have a hard time understanding what this means, but the throughput is essentially determined by a number of, a number of different factors: the size of the instances, so your application gateway instances, you can have one one up to I think ten by default. Um, you can get that increase with a with a service request or a quota increase, um, but by default you go up to ten, um, and it's determined by the, the size, the number of instances, and how big the uh, data is coming through the gateway, coming back on the backend page response. So let's say you have an HTML page that's 6K, you're going to get about 13 megabit per second per instance on a medium SKU WAF. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you have a backend page response that's about 100K, you'll get about 100 megabit per second. It does better with larger sets of data streaming through rather than small intermittent sets of data. Yeah. Yeah. So um, viewing throughput and determining average throughput that's coming through WAP based on some load tests is probably the right way to go if you're doing a sizing exercise. 
And there's lots of great tools to do load tests. I mean, we could spend a whole other call just talking about Visual Studio load tests and things like that. So Oop, there's um, part two. <laughs> yeah, there's part two. So uh, actually, I was using Visual Studio load tests to uh, to get some metrics on this, so that I'd nice. have something to show when we get down to uh, throughput uh, throughput responses. So okay, well, that's part one. Part two, probes. Probes are confusing for everybody. Um, you really have to know what you're what you're probing against. Um, I work with a lot of infrastructure engineers who don't log on to the box and figure out, hey, um, how is this thing being hosted? Uh, is it on a default website? Will it respond to uh, just the IP address putting getting put in? Like in a scenario where you're just putting the IP address in and you expect a response back from a box, then you can use a probe host of 127.0.0.1, basically the home address, right? Um, if it will respond on an IP, that works. If it won't respond on an IP, if, it, if it's expecting a host name, your probe also has to provide that host name. So in this scenario, let's say you have two websites on an IIS box, right? You have one on your default website, and let's say you have an API that's also hosted on there. Probably not a great uh, architectural pattern. You probably want to separate not those judging. out a little bit for scale. But hey, let's uh, let's let's give us let's give an easy scenario. And in that scenario, since you're, you have a specified host name, your probe has to have a specified host name, right? So any scenario where it's looking for a host name, provide it in your probe host. Okay. Um, default healthy codes range from 200 to 399. So most of the time people think, well, everything has to respond with a 200 OK. Not necessarily true. It goes all the way up to yeah. 399. That's, <clears throat> that's fine. Um, and two things on the third point. Um, before, you, have to, you used to have to do PowerShell um, to do anything over 400. So let's say you have a website that is making use of authentication, right? So normally when a probe would hit that, it'd come back with a 401 unauthorized, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could use this and say, hey, you know what? This, the, the range that we're going to go for is 200 to 401. All of those are okay. Or let's say that you want to include forbidden and 404 not found, right? So you go from 200 to 404 if you so chose. Yeah. Um, all of those are okay. Um, it's something that I've had a lot of customers, you know, really bang their head against the wall. They're like, well, I have to get an okay status, and that means I have to have an unsecured page within my application. Not necessarily oh, true. Yeah. You know, I, this is, that was one of the other things, and I'm glad that we've gotten out of the PowerShell configuration and more into the UI space because, you know, again, it's about speed and e ease and, and simplification of it, right? So, but um, right. I had some guys that write custom API codes that were like, hey, I need something at the, you know, 454. And I'm like, well, what? And it's like, yeah, that's just the way we wrote our app. Yeah. It's like, okay, fine, let's go do this. So, yeah. yeah. The, the other cool I, thing I actually had a, I had a customer just speaking of, of response codes that they had a, a pool of uh, web servers that had um, uh, that had some web jobs that would run on them. You know, so when data, when, when tasks would be placed into a queue, the web job would kick off. And they wanted to... to um, extend the entire power of that machine to some types of operations. Mm -hmm. So they actually had an, a a page that would that the probe was hitting that would basically flip that machine off. Uh -huh. um, so so, so it, was a, it, it could respond to web web requests. When it got busy, it would just say, "No, nah, no, don't send me anything," and it would just return oh. a bad a bad response to the probe. And it was it was kind of an interesting. I thought you say it was going to return like a six six six. I was like, "No, oh, that's, that's wrong." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, it's a creative way to kind of you know, <laughs> yeah, that is yeah, <laughs> yeah, and actually, this is this is uh, something that I just saw this week. So um, I saw that they added this into the portal. So before you had to do PowerShell for this, this is inside of the portal now. Um, so you can actually define your um, probe match conditions both for the response codes and response body. So let's say your your customer is using something like Big IP, right? Which will mm -hmm. which will have a response body that might come back with either I'm okay or I'm not okay, right? Yeah. So you yeah. could you could basically put that into the response body. Your you might get a positive code back, like you get a 200 okay back, but the Big IP response will be I'm not okay. So you should yeah. take that out of the balance out of the load balance uh, scenario, right? Yeah. Mm. Nice. So all of that's available in the portal now. It's literally just this week I saw it pop up. And finally, the, the last one, the last one I, I deal with, unknown backend health status. Um, this, this happens for two reasons. And this, this happens every time I go to troubleshoot a, uh, an application gateway. Um, you know, 
I'll go look at back end health status because I, that's the first thing I should do. I should always mm-hmm. go see if my back ends are healthy and all the probes are configured correctly and everything's reporting um, reporting healthy with big green check boxes on that uh, on that page. And most of the time when I get there with one that's having a problem, I see unknown unknown mm-hmm. gray boxes everywhere. <laughs> and there's only two reasons that happens. It's when the monitoring service inside of Azure Paths cannot get into your VNet. So wherever that application gateway is, you have, have to allow traffic in from Azure Monitoring or the application gateway cannot get back out to Azure Monitoring. So there's a couple things to be aware of. There's, there's, if you're using NFGs on your subnets, which is a great security practice to limit traffic in, making sure that only traffic that meets certain pattern can get into your subnet. Um, you need to ensure that TCP is allowed over, over these ports defined, 65503 to 534. Um, Azure Load Balancer tag traffic like is allowed that. inbound. Yep. Yep. And then for outbound rules that it can get back out to the internet. And I've also seen a lot of people having problems when they have express route on here because what will happen um, by default is they'll have force tunneling enabled. So all the traffic that's routing outbound is going to slam into some firewall someplace and never get back out to Azure monitoring service. So um, if, if that is the case in your scenario, then a, a route table on that subnet where the application gateway is living um, out to the internet is recommended. Now that's that's actually a, that's an interesting point. So the app gateway, and I think this is something that we need to call out for our our viewers and our customers here is, is the app gateway goes into its own subnet, so it gives you that uh, route plane that doesn't have to get folded into everything else. But I think infrastructure guys by default go well. Everything gets this. They set a policy so that everything gets the same rule set, and there they can run. They think of it as something you you would put into a rack and put put an right. Ethernet cable into versus right. the software right. defined topology that we yeah. have in our yeah. yeah. Good point. Right. Right. So uh, that, that, that's a great point. Well, I bring it up, too, because I've had customers that build one big massive VNet and then a couple big subnets, and they go, we're done. I'm like, so what happens when you want to add an app no. gateway? And they're like, what are you talking about? We'll just plug it into this this subnet and go, mm, no, nope, not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones that uh, sort of requires its own subnet. Like, you can only yeah. put application gateways in an application gateway subnet. Um, it, it won't coexist with other services. So it's right. not like you can say, hey, my app gateway is going to go in here with my ASE and my API management, <laughs> both of which also require their own subnet. <laughs> yeah, good point. Yeah, good point. But, I, no. but you know, at the same time, I think that's actually something customers don't realize is an advantage to them, right? They see yeah. that as a, as a Azure sucks, and we're like, no, 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 no. This, if you think about this in a broader sense, this is actually a good thing for you. So just go with it, right? Trust us. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's more of an empowering measure, not a limiting yep. measure. And it's something that people just need to think about when they're doing their network security design and yep. you know how big, how big their VNet address space really needs to be to support yep. their, their workload entirely. Yep. Um, speaking of supporting, um, Let's talk about how to measure performance analytics. Uh, <laughs> Phoenix Patrick uh, <laughs> has arrived to tell us how much fun it is to read JSON logs. Um, <laughs> so you can stuff them in a storage account. Um, terrific JSON format, really easy to read. I love reading JSON. It's a good time. You could write your own reporting platform against them. Um, you can do toolkits. You can uh, really expand your capabilities as a developer and provide a powerful integration. Uh, don't do any of that. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell. Don't do any of that. Yeah. Um, instead, uh, let's take Phoenix Patrick. Let's flip him. There, he looks happier now. Um, log analytics is way better for this. Uh, yep. So this is, this is a great capability for um, being able to chart, uh, determine throughput, do, do any, a, any metric that you're capturing from an application gateway uh, gets routed into log analytics. It, the IntelliSense on, in log analytics in both uh, just the standard product and then when you go a little bit deeper into the analytics portal inside of log analytics is really great. Like you do not have to be an expert. Um, as long as you have a good starting point, you start there, you can look at your results and then start building your own queries in, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. So I got and, one for you here. I got a question. Well, sure. Hand. So the VPN gateways, when we first came out with them, were very problematic from a sizing perspective because 
the traffic wasn't hitting the theoretical limits or whatever. And it turned out to find out it was like either CPU pressure or memory pressure inside the VMs that were running the VPN service, right? Right. So at this point, now you know where I'm going, is have mm-hmm. we made advances here to show infrastructure uh, pressures that may be leading to bad app gateway performances? That's that's a great point. Um, this is something that I had to do um, a couple weeks ago, and maybe it has changed since then, but we mm-hmm. w- weren't able to get CPU metrics from yeah. the gateway um, through log analytics yet. Okay. Um, yep. I think right. I think that's coming. Um, right now, every time I need to go look at how a uh, gateway is performing, if, if it's if it's pegged, but it's not really hitting those throughput targets, I have to get yeah. it all going. Okay, so now I'm not trying to put you on the spot because this isn't okay. play stump at them. That's that's you can do that in reverse. <laughs> I would like then to call out the simplified metrics. Then you, you would say these are probably your best practices to put in place from a from a monitoring perspective for your app gateways and health. That's Go. a good point. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it, it's funny. I get you one a that. show. I just get one a show. Okay, ah. so I'm done. I'm going to let them clock out. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that, that perfectly teed off the next thing, which is a demo. Oh. <laughs> so why, yeah, and why are you kicking or switching over the demo? I mean, it, it's, you know, under the covers, it is a virtual machine, and that's kind of what, exactly. what, yeah, that's what yeah. he was talking about. That, that, a lot of you people know, we abstract that away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> yep. We have built services on top of virtual machines, and I think that's what people are like, Oh, don't you have this some type of appliance that's running the rack and you've partitioned out? We're like, no, 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 no. We, that's not what's going on here, right? Right. That's right. <clears throat> so let me get in here and let's get into log analytics and see how we're uh, see how we're doing this next generation. Yeah, because I think that's one of the other things too. To the number of instances that you can scale horizontally your app gateway, a lot of people don't realize we're just spinning up VMs, right? That's right. Yep. yep, that's right. Okay, I'm getting my uh, log analytics workspace opened up here. Dun dun dun. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the best part too here, just as a quick plug, is it's not in the separate OMS portal. A lot of people end yep. up showing this too. This is slick. Yep. One pane of glass. One Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So let's do. Call me a fanboy. Let's check. So all my, I only have one app gateway running through here. So basically, this is all under Azure Diagnostics. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm specifying where I'm specifying resource provider and category. Yep. Um, and right. then let's say I want to get um, just let's get one more one more pace in here. Resource and resource group. Right. Mm-hmm. This tells me all the gateways I have running. This will give me a list. That's not very exciting. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there, there it is. That's yep, pretty exciting. Okay. Um, let's, uh, well, let's go back here, and let's actually go into the analytics portal, just because I think this part's really neat. Right. Um, and let's say, let's check latency. That's what we're going to oh, do when this loads up. Yes. Because this is something people care about. Latency. So let me uh, let me comment this out and just show what, what we're going to get back. And um, you'll see how this is this is actually pretty easy to pull out on run. So each of these has you know some information inside of it, right? Mm-hmm. So I can actually go in here, look at the fields figure out what I want to query, and then through just a little bit of experience with working with this, right? So let's say, you know, summarize average of my latency by the resource, and then show, show me latency over one-minute intervals, and then finally give me, a time sh- give me a time chart. Show me what that looks like, right? And then... I'm glad you can read Kusto. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> And then oh, it looks nice. like I can see when I ran my last uh, my last load test. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I might say you might have a performance issue right there, but uh, yeah, you know, it one yep. spike does not make a problem. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. Um, it's a it's a pattern pattern yep. of those, right? That's right. 
So um, there's a bunch of these. Um, also, here's another one that, that I like to look at, like, hey, what's going on with the application firewall, right? So mm -hmm. what are the rules that are getting hit? So I was a bad guy when I did my load test, and I put in some XP command shells um, in my query strings, mm -hmm. and yes. I could see the different attacks that got picked up on the last load test I ran. Okay, cool. all right. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to push you a little here. All right. In, inside these, do we have the actual endpoint data from the attacker's perspective? I so, IP address. Yeah. So here, let's uh, let's go in here, and I did. I sort of summarized this data and cleaned that mm -hmm. out of there, so it wouldn't okay. appear. But let me run all of it. Perfect. Now, the answer is yes. Yeah. It's yeah, in there. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I figured as much, right? <laughs> right. So here's where it's coming from, yep. from that fiendishvisualstudio.com website. Oh, curse you. You are evil. Source of, uh, source of all evil in the universe, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> I can tell by looking at you. <laughs> no, but that's but yeah. cool. So now we can yeah. take this to our customers. Who you can see what to, rule it was. And, yeah, have to that's report cool. this. Yeah. Or in, in exactly. a breach event or any type of event where they have to review security logs. This is a key piece that I'll just say in the past 18 months, light years difference, light years Yeah, difference. absolutely. Like, go, nobody likes reading through JSON logs. Being oh, able to pull oh. something out like this and visualize it quickly is mm -hmm. such a such an added value benefit. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, and then let me, uh, let me plug one more thing, because you asked before, hey, I want... I want to know all the things that are really great to know about my Azure Application Gateway. And <laughs> yeah. yep, there, there's a way to do that too. So I mentioned custom dashboards before, and this is something that somebody else at Microsoft put together, Rob Davies. He did a great job of isolating, basically saying, hey, here's all the things I would want to see inside of App Gateway in terms of performance. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a nice enough guy to put it inside of an ARM template, which is great. Wow. Because now what I can do is I can deploy this out. Here, I'm going to deploy this to the resource group real quick. We'll wait for this. Do, 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 do. Now, you, you got to do the Jeopardy theme on this show, man. You <laughs> can't do a good Je Jeopardy <laughs> theme. You're out. You're yeah. gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to trigger that deployment. That would be great. And let's wait for that to wait for that to finish real quick. It should be it should be pretty quick. Oh yeah. Good. I think I fed the squirrels today, so we should be good. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you did pay your bill, right? <laughs> and template deployed. <laughs> There we go. I guess he did. Oh, let's uh, let's dig back in here ideas. and go to if I go to my dashboards and my subscription. So this is the dashboard that I just published. Now, a lot of people don't use these, but these are uh, these are pretty neat. Um, come on, show me all of them. There, there's the one I just deployed. It popped up. Mm -hmm. Now I can say, give me all the information about my application gateway. I want to see the high level view. So basically, this is your this is your not view. Right, dude. Please tell me this is being published in our GitHub stuff. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah. Please tell yeah. me we're doing that. Yes. Okay. It is. Say, we, we will put the 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 link to that in our show notes for sure. Good yeah. grief. Cool. Yes. But this is freaking awesome, right? Yeah, it is. By API, like you can actually go in and customize these and segment out the different APIs that you're calling and figure out, you know, hey, what API am I, are we getting failures on? You can get some good granular tracking across the entire service nice. okay. just from this one dashboard. And the cool thing is, um, and I, I know I'm running a little bit long here, but let's say you wanted to pin something into this dashboard. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the wrong button. I'm going to edit that out. Fail. Okay. <laughs> no. Let's say you want to add the top uh, the top guys that have occurred in here, right? These these firewall rules, because right now no firewall rules are written into there. This is something you can go in and customize later. There's a little pin right here, and this is hopefully this is moved, and uh, people that are watching this in the future aren't going to be able to find it. But this will allow you to pin a query that you're running from Log Analytics back into those dashboards that you shared out. So Keep here's there. all my dashboards. Boom! Now it's there. Okay. 
All right, I'm sold. I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll work with Azure any that day is now. Cool. Yeah, this is slick. Yeah, the 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 custom dashboards are amazing. Like especially when you're talking about um, organizations that are really struggling operationally and really want to be able to get high level views of how the resources are performing. Um, this is something that's super powerful and underutilized. Oh yeah, so but and I think these are things we should be pushing out of the box. You know, those are just those are must haves. At the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Oh. And there it is. All the way over there. Oh, nice. oh, very cool. <laughs> it's going to take a minute to load, but it'll come All back. Right, Adam. You're my new favorite friend. <laughs> nice. nice. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so you showed us kind of end to end, you know, what we talked first of all about the why, and then we talked about various ways and, you know, the how. Um, and then we also dove in and actually demonstrated how to set it up and how to monitor it, which I think is a, you know, really critical ingredient. When you have something that you can't touch and feel, that's, you know, this appliance that we're deploying for customers, um, you know, having the ability to dive in and see what the heck's going on, uh, you know, behind the curtain is, uh, is important. So that's a, you know, really good end-to-end -end story. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That's all I got for you guys today. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's I more than enough. It, unfortunately, more it, it, it was all good stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank uh, you, Adam. Nice job. All right, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll stave off some of the bad guys from some of our customers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> See some <laughs> more frying crudo, uh, frying crudos, <laughs> crying frodos. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Wow. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks again, Adam, uh, and thank you, Matthew. Um, you know, we'll we'll po post some of the links to the stuff that Adam walked through on our show notes on uh, CloudSimplified.io, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yep. Take care.